chapter of Romans. If you don't, it's printed in the bulletin. I prefer you to use your Bible, but if you don't have them, it's in the bulletin. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. Uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse 8 and read through the conclusion of the chapter. And as I do that, I had to, to choose a title for Pam, the worship team. Uh, the title is The Time Is Now. The Time Is Now. And if you'll keep that in mind, as the scripture is read again, open it up for you. We believe the Bible will be the Word of God. Our only infallible rule of faith and life. Well, let us attend to the reading of God's Word. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. I, I like the way the Phillips translation paraphrase handles verse 12, uh, verse 11. Let, let me read that to you, and then I'll continue reading. The Phillips paraphrase says, why all this stress on behavior? He just outlined the commandments. Because, as I think you have realized, the present time is of the highest importance. It's time to wake up to reality. Every day brings God's salvation nearer. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in origins or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. May God bless our hearing and understanding and our application of His Word to our lives. Father, speak to us this morning. We're here to learn. We are the church, the Kaha Yahweh, the Ecclesia, gathered around the Word of God to worship, to be instructed, and to live. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I don't need to remind you, but I, I will, that we're living at a very critical mo moment in history. Christianity is at a crossroads. The old categories that we once embraced very openly are being replaced by new categories. The threats and the opportunities that are facing us this morning are monumental. For example, in our own country, the land of the free and the home of the brave, there's a growing anti-Christian and an anti-church sentiment that's permeating our culture. There's moral decay and decline where the foundations are being removed from beneath us. And you know what I'm talking about. You read the news. You see how the government is more and more usurping the role of religion in making moral and ethical judgments and decisions and determining things like what is a family or what are the roles of individuals in a family. What constitutes life and what constitutes death? And with the holocaust of abortions very high up on our list, with all the monstrous deaths and useless killings associated with our crime wave, our faltering economic system, our sad education system 
where seniors are being graduated from high school without the ability to read at a third grade level and to think critically. Teenage pregnancy. Record numbers still to this day of marriage breakups. Our political candidates living by double standards at best defining truth in their roles according to their agenda and their worldview. Misusing our political system for their own personal use and gain. This is without a doubt a very critical moment for us in history. Think globally with me for a minute. Do we really understand the impact of what is going on in our world today? Do we know what's really happening in Europe and in the Middle East? Can we really understand that and how it is impacting our lives right here? And on the one hand, we want to stand and we want to shout for joy and we want to cheer because of America, America's role in leading the way take the good news of the gospel of the kingdom uh, to the different nations of the world. And because of America's role historically in promoting and supporting global peace. People around the world are wanting democracy, not a totalitarian form of government. It's thinking of the growing animosity, stealing from from everything such as the religious and, and ethnic rivalry going on to the political chaos to the overthrow of, of leaders. We heard about that last week from our, our missionary brother in Egypt and beyond. Unemployment in the Asian countries is at an all-time high. Massive starvation in Africa. Hundreds of people were killed just this week in the Congo. Then there's the sales of arms to Iran, to Syria. CIA's concern over the buildup of germ warfare. They're concerned over the growing nuclear arsenals that are in the hands of evil, wicked people. The growth of the Islamic religion. Muslims doing the very things now that they've accused Christians down through the centuries of doing. And that is forcing their religion on people their Sharia law. So we have to ask ourselves, what's really going on right now? What's really happening in our world? How much more of this can we tolerate and survive? Where is it all going to lead? Does anyone really know? To be honest, friends, this is a very dangerous time in our history. It's very dangerous very frightening as we compress some of the global events that are taking place. And yet it's a very challenging time. And I thought about this. If God had said, Charles, I'll let you live at any point in history you want to live, knowing what I know, I will choose today. It is a dangerous time, yes. It is a challenging time, yes. But it's also an exciting time, especially if we know the Lord. As I read God's Word, and the other reason I say this is in the Word of God, for example, you read the 17th chapter of Acts, the Bible says that God determines the times and the exact places where we're to live. Think about that. God determines the times and the exact places where we're to live. It's no accident that you and I are here this morning. It's no accident that we're here in 2013 on the calendar. God has orchestrated all of this. And he tells us about it in his word. And he uses someone like David, a very well-known Bible character, to make his point. In Acts 13, he makes a Paul preached, he makes a reference to David. He said, David was a man who served God's purpose in his own generation. And then he fell asleep with his fathers, awaiting the resurrection at the end. Why are we here? It's that simple. God has already told us. 
And I don't care what you might answer, God has already preempted us with the right answer. We are here at his appointment to serve his purpose to this generation. There's no other explanation for why you and I are here today. There's no doubt about it. And when we die and go to heaven, if we do that before the Lord returns, every one of us should desire that on our grave marker something like this would be, be there. Here lies a person who served God's purpose in his or her life. Because you see, everything fades in that light. But what does serving God's purpose really involve? First of all, it involves standing with our feet firmly planted in God's truth. God's truth, yes, there is truth. Truth is not relative. There are absolutes. Jesus is the truth. Jesus said to Pilate, not only am I the truth, I have come to bear witness to the truth. Think about that. I don't know about you if you read the same, some of the same stuff I read, but it grieves my heart when I read the polls such as the Gallup polls that says that the unchurched people, the unchurched people have been continually lost confidence in the church because the church is not viewed by the unchurched people as standing for the truth today. Unchurched people are saying that, mind you. They're revealing a very cynical attitude about the church. And part of the rationale for that is, is they say the church is no different from any other human social organization. It may do some good things, but standing firmly planted in the truth is not one of the things that they point to. We would want the church to stand for the truth. And we have to listen to those who are reminding us that that may not always be happening. That the church's light is not shining that brightly in the midst of this darkness. You see, friends, you and I are not living in a Christian context in America today. I'm sure you know that. If you wanted to live in a solidly Christian environment, I have to tell you, you were born 200 years too late. Again, the polls tell us that we're living at a time when people have no real comprehension as to what Christianity is all about. When my friend, the late Chuck Colson, wrote his last book entitled The Faith, he wrote that book because he said, I, I'm just more and more concerned of how many Christian people don't understand or really know what they say they believe. Dr. George Hunter, professor at Asbury Seminary, wrote an article in which he said that we're living at a most unusual moment in history. And from there, he makes a couple of observations that I'll share with you. First of all, he said, for the last 150 to 200 years, we have lived under the influence of the Enlightenment philosophy in America. That's the philosophy that preaches and teaches about the goodness of man, about man's ability, about man's not sensing a need of God in his life because he believed that he had all that was necessary to get him through life. Really interesting that philosophy, which has existed for so long, which has been supplanted by postmodernism today, the Apostle Paul back in Romans 1 called that kind of philosophy stupid, absurd, silly, doesn't work. Man is not his own problem solver. Man doesn't have all the answers. Man is not innately good. We don't have unlimited resources. And all the naturalistic, humanistic, secularistic thinking today 
has caused us to come up empty. Hunter made a further observation that I thought was very interesting. He said, we're living in a time today similar to the first century. Because in many ways, he said, people today are very much like people back then. And he asked, how, are they, how are, is that so? And his answer was, because people today are basically agnostics. Agnostics. Not agnostics who don't believe in God. Are not agnostics who believe they know everything there is to know. But agnostics. People who don't know and are ignorant that they don't know. Have no true knowledge of God. Or Jesus Christ. Or the gospel truth. And many are even hostile to it when it is proclaimed. And as Christians, we have a real challenge. A real challenge and a real responsibility to communicate the word of God to this generation by word and deed. This agnostic generation, as Hunter calls it. That's very difficult because even the church has lost sight more and more of its role in the world. The church doesn't generally see itself today as a beacon of light, a haven of hope and rest for hurting sinful people. So outside, people are looking at the church and they're saying things like, you know, people inside the church are just like we are. We live by the same standards, the standards of the world, and we're not really that different. Here in the first century, if we can look back to the moment of history, the church was not the center of community life. It did become that later on for a while in history. And though there are social factors today that hinder the churches from being the center of community life today, such as people are very transient today, people don't put down roots today, people move from place to place very easily, just to mention a few things. But yet, in thinking about that, I am still convinced on the Word of God that God intends for His community of believers to be salt and light in this world. So you see, if that's true, friends, it is absolutely critical, it is absolutely strategic for us to be here today. We are here to serve God's purpose to this generation at this very moment. And to further underscore this, as we read in our scripture from Romans 13, the Apostle Paul said something here that I don't think we can afford to overlook. His words are couched, I believe, in serious urgency. And after calling us in those opening verses to obey God's law, to do, keep the commandments, and so on, then Paul asked, Why all this stress, Paul, on behavior? Why are you talking about what we should be doing? And he said, Because as I think you have realized, this present time is of the highest importance. That's why. What this suggests to me is I see the storm clouds gathering on the horizon. And I see the sun appearing to be setting on Western civilization. We need to realize, number one, that this present time is of the highest importance. Two, as Paul said, we need to wake up to reality of what's really going on. In Paul's words in Romans 13 were not just for the first century Christians back then. It's the living word of God that's for us as well today. You know, we become so consumer-oriented in our lifestyle. And our 
commitments reflect that we have so much bought into illusion that we don't see the importance of this moment. You and I are living in an enemy territory. The world is not the friendliest place for us to be. It's not our home. We're only covered with strangers who are passing through on a journey to our final home. And one of the ways that people try to cope with what's going on in the world today is to escape into, into the world of illusion or fantasy. You see, because if we live from that framework, then we can make ourselves believe things are really the way we think they are and not see them as they really are. Therefore, Paul says in Romans 13, arm yourselves for the fight of the day. That's what he said. Now, fighting implies battle. Battle implies warfare. Christianity is a religion of truth, yes, but it's a religion of truth that engages us in spiritual warfare. And to fight in that warfare, we must be trained, we must be equipped, we must be discipled, we must be prepared for that battle. And we have to realize that the battle that we're talking about is a spiritual battle. Not to be fought by might or power. So that means that as Christians, we are to be fighters. Engaged in spiritual combat. But then Paul puts that in the context. That not only are you and I as Christians to be fighters. We are to be lovers. We are to be lovers. We are to love God, and we are to love one another. And yet the sin that we fight is so deceitful. And what often happens is because of that deceitfulness is we end up fighting each other and loving sin instead of loving one another and fighting sin. That's what illusion does. It causes us to get things all mixed up and confused and chaotic. One of the things it does, according to one, to one of the guys I've enjoyed reading, is it has turned us into consumeristic neophiliacs. Consumeristic <coughs> neophiliacs. We love things. Especially new things. New things have a way of just keeping us going in life. We really like new things. We don't have much of an attachment to old things. We move from, away from tradition. We move away from absolute truth. We move away from church. Because we love the new and the novel. They seem to give us that illusion of happiness. But friends, a world without God at the center a life without Christ at the center is not, is not the real world. It's only an illusion. It's only a fantasy. Sooner or later, the bubble will burst. And we'll realize that truth. The emperor has on no clothes as the little boy said to that deluded and denuded crowd, praising the king for his nakedness, having been deceived by his own servants. Now, why do I say all these things to you today? I say them first of all because I believe they're true. If I didn't, I wouldn't say them. And I say them also because of who we are. We are the church of Jesus Christ. When I read in some of the different polls that 
49% of the unchurched people say that the church is not effectively helping people develop a meaning of, to find meaning for, a meaning to life. That has a way of kind of capturing my attention. But when I read that 39% of the people in the church say the same thing, that the church is not helping me to find meaning for my life, that really gets my attention. Even though I realize that it may be a subterfuge or, or a cop-out for some to say that, I can't ignore the fact that they say it. You see, there was a time in our history when the church was the salt and light within the community. If you doubt that, just go to some of the southern, little southern towns or some of the New England towns or some of the older colleges and university campuses and what do you see? Right in the center of that community, you see church buildings and chapels. Come on, the holy house today, but you can still tell at one time the church was there. So there was a time when the church made a difference in our culture. If I read the polls correctly, and this is the thing that keeps me going, especially at my age, I'm like David in his old age in Psalm 71. I believe from everything I'm reading and all my contacts that I've had over the years with the younger generation, there is a younger generation known as the millennials who are beginning to say, we want the church to stand for something. We want to be a part of the church that stands for the truth. See, prior to the Reformation, Calvin and Luther, but during the Dark Ages, the church was not held in very high esteem. And today, because of modernity and postmodernism and secularism, the whole humanistic thrust, the church in general is not held in high esteem. And even those who are willing to believe that Christianity offers hope to the world's immediate needs are not certain. They really believe that. I have, I have a friend, Bill Tackett, in his series on the Truth Project. He raises a question. Do you really believe what you say you believe is real? Do you really believe it? That, it, that it's real? The church has a role to play in the world today. To serve this generation, that can't be downplayed. The church has the role of not only speaking prophetically God's word, God's will in mind, but also to demonstrate the presence and the power of God among us. Remember the Old Testament, how the tabernacle symbolized God's power and God's presence among the, the church. The visible church today, this church, has the the calling from God to demonstrate that God is real and He's active today. When people look at St. Paul's church, they should be reminded that God is real. And God is in the world. Not because of the stained glass windows or the brick and mortar, but because of the things that are happening in the world as a result of this church being here. My heart was saddened some time ago when I read a survey that was done among teenagers in Dayton, Ohio. And the conclusion was the church is not living up to its message and its mission. <laughs> St. Paul's church is the body of Christ. He's the super glue that holds people, that bonds them together with people and with God himself. He's the one that keeps marriages together. And I can tell you in all my years of ministry and counseling, I have yet to counsel a couple showing me from Scripture that it was God's will for them to divorce. There are some biblical right? God holds families together. 
God holds nations together. God holds the peoples from those nations together. Friends, don't ever sell short the impact that St. Paul's Church can have for the Lord here. No matter its size, St. Paul's exists in a very significant world city of Atlanta. That's where we are. And God determines the time and the places where we're to be. Atlanta needs St. Paul's and other Bible-believing churches to make a difference in this significant city. Remember, Israel was small in number in comparison. God used Israel to do significant things for him in the Old Testament church days. He uses the church, regardless of the size, to accomplish key result things that he sets for us to do. We see what happens in the book of Acts when we read that that little church came together to be under the teaching of the apostles, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Christians are not to be like gypsies, flitting here and there, hither and yon, not putting down roots, actually moving as an escape. So St. Paul says this, to glorify God in his worship and work, in his mission and his message and ministry. St. Paul's exists to demonstrate righteous conduct in the midst of a fallen world. We are here to arm ourselves for the spiritual battle that we have to fight. And as we do that, we have to remember that our, our weapons are the gospel, not politics. It's Jesus Christ and his kingdom, not man-made economic strategy. The Word of God, not military might and power. The Holy Spirit given to us by Christ Himself to impact the world for Him with biblical love. The greater love is no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friend. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. We have love one for the other. You see, my friends, please know this. Satan, our arch enemy, has no power over genuine Christian love. You can take that home with you. Satan has no power over genuine Christian love. Satan cannot destroy a Christian marriage where Christian love is present. He cannot destroy the church that's knit together in Christ's love. And when we love Christ more than anything else, our lives can be so positive that God can use them to actually make us a part of his changing people's hearts and lives. How? As Paul tells us by remembering and practicing who we are in Christ and our oneness with the faith. By having that unity of heart and purpose, which is vital to the church's success. We're not divided. All one body and unity. One in hope and doctrine. One in charity. And I can show you from Scripture about mentioning to the elders the other night that when our heart and mind are unified and we have one main purpose in life together that whatever we set out to do nobody will be able to stop it because God will be in it. So God chose for St. Paul's to be here. This is his body, 
in this place. And we must be known for our holiness of life and our oneness in spirit and purpose, united and held together in the love of Christ. And along with who we are now, we are to be a universal Catholic church where possible, consisting of those from every tongue, nation, tribe, and people. You see, our role as a church is to be as much like its head, Jesus Christ, as we possibly humanly can be right now. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. And because he died on the cross and he rose again from the grave, he has the power of command from God the Father. And he says, by that power, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Members of St. Paul, we come together this morning to celebrate the amazing grace of God that's, that's revealed to us in Jesus Christ, especially as we come to the Lord's table now. We remember these words. We celebrate St. Because God has given us a tremendous opportunity to be the visible presence of the kingdom of God here at the corner of Arts and Piedmont. Right. St. Paul's is a branch of the church of the kingdom of God. It's here for a purpose. But we must have his purpose before us which involves an outward focus. We must have a missional ministry. Christ in his great commission has commissioned that we be missional. Right here. We have a role to play. And we pray that we'll be able to carry out that role until the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, you see, it's, it's a wonderful privilege for us to be able to love one another in Jesus' name. To confess Him as our Lord and King and to serve Him in our life and work. So as we come to the Lord's table this morning, I'm going to ask you a question. In light of that, what I said, what is your spirit? How would you express your role or your reason for being? Can you come to the table with us and celebrate the marvelous grace of God that has loved us and made atonement for our sins? And then, what is your hope and vision for St. Paul's? What are you praying for? I hope it's to be a people on a mission of serving God and committing ourselves to Him and being what He wants us to be for this generation in this place. St. Paul's success will come only as it carries out God's plan for her. So as we come to the Lord's table this morning, let us come expressing genuine faith in Jesus Christ, trusting Him as our Lord and Savior, and celebrate together His marvelous grace that has brought us together here at this moment in history to serve His purpose to this generation. I pray that you are committed to that. If you're not, if you pray about that. That you'll not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And if you're here this morning and have not yet trusted Christ for your salvation, and not yet experienced his love and forgiveness and acceptance, I invite you to do that. I ask you to do that. If it comes to me, he said, I will know why.